Hello, and thank you so much for tuning into the She Can Ball podcast. I'm your host, Mahi Jariwala. Today, we're joined by Kareth Burke, the courtside reporter for the Golden State Warriors. How has it been? I know the season started not too long ago. It feels great right now to be back after the COVID season when we couldn't do anything in person, to make eye contact with people, to feel them out for jokes. Um, it's a lot better this year. And like, you know, just what is it like to be in an atmosphere with fans again in the Chase Center? It really feels different because there is an energy in the building. Everybody is exciting to excited to be there. And when the flows of the game get really get exciting, when Steph Curry splashes the three, I mean, everybody just goes nuts and, and you really can feel it. It feels like a wave of attention or yeah, energy is the word um, coursing through that place. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I, I went to the Warrior game like a few years ago and I haven't been in a while, but the energy in there just, it's different. Mm -hmm. It feels great in there. It, it makes me happy to go to work. And that's, I feel lucky saying that. And like, what does a day in your life, like a game day look like? Oh man. Um, well, it starts with, on, on a game day, it starts with shoot around. So that usually happens at about 11 a.m. That's when reporters can go in and talk to players. Then I go home, get dressed, do makeup, have a really quick lunch. Then I go back to the arena. I have pregame duties. Um, we talk to Steve. Sometimes we can talk to a player in the tunnel very quickly. Um, and then it's watching the game and it's figuring out what I want to talk about post game. And then a lot of interviews happen post game. And that's even leaving out um, what I used to do when I had in game reports. Um, this season, my, my company isn't using a sideline reporter. Um, it might be back next year. Um, but yeah, I still feel really busy <laughs> and really lucky that I get to do this job. Yeah, I mean, the post-game interviews were crazy because I think, you know, everyone watches that. I mean, you watch the game, you see what happens, and you kind of get to, like, gain insight on, like, what they were thinking and just, like, what was going through their head throughout that time. I mean, how do you formulate post-game questions? Oh, it's all emotional. Um, and, and I like your point. It's like 30 seconds after a huge game, they wander over to me, emotions are high. And sometimes I'll just read what's on their face. Sometimes they might have a win, but they're not happy about how they won. So, all right, you asked me, how do I formulate my questions? Um, first, I like to ask a team question. It's easier to ask a player who just scored 50 points to talk about something other than themselves at first, actually, it helps them warm up and then you can kind of get them to brag on it. Um, and then like, so I like to do a team question first, an individual question, and then like my third question is sort of like, sum it up. I, I talk about, you know, no, going in, I like to know what are the trends happening for the team right now? If say the three point shooting is down, but as a team, they had 20 of them, that's great, what changed? or I'll look ahead to something that's on the schedule, um, or sometimes it is a, a place to play around. You know, like I noticed you pointed at your son in the stands. What did you want him to know about that moment? Those kind of things. But it's all just sort of reading what the player is up for. Um, and that's why some of the, the fun things happen, some of the more viral things, um, you know, that get shared a lot. So do you go in with like three questions or whatever? Do you go in with like multiple questions and you're kind of like, okay, I can just choose whatever I want on the spot? Yeah, I usually have some bullet points. Um, so preparedness is very important to me. So I know about, I try to remember who, what's the history with the team the Warriors are playing? Do any of the players have individual history? Um, for example, um, Kelly Oubre Jr. is going to be at the next game. He plays for the Charlotte Hornets now. Was there any interaction between the players? Um, because fans really like talking about people who were once Warriors. Um, I have, you know what, uh, and I, I sort of keep something in my hand. It's about this big and I'll have tiny little bullet points. It's like defense and then one number because sometimes Mahi, I, I blank actually. The emotions are so high. I need to glance at my paper just really quick to sort of pull myself back into myself so I can do that job. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I do want to backtrack a little bit to kind of just the beginning of your career. Like where did you grow up and how did sports impact you growing up? Thank you for this question. Um, I'm from an army family actually. So I sort of feel like I'm from everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> um, where I went to high school and college is in Washington state. So as long as my parents are still there, I think that's home. And we, I mean, my sister and I played Gosh, soccer, tennis, t-ball. Um, I did basketball, cross country, and track. Um, 
I think my dad, I mean, my dad loves to play hockey. He taught my sister and I how to skate. So sports were just always part of our, our life. And although I love basketball and I played, I wasn't good enough for a scholarship. I didn't play in college. Um, I played in a rec league, but I know enough. You can become a student of the game. I feel like I can talk to any athlete with the right amount of preparation, to sort of understand where they're coming from and at least have the basics. And then from there, ask people emotional questions like, what was that like for you? And you can have a conversation with a gold medalist, even you're not a gold medalist. Um, it, it's just about relating to people. Yeah, no, I think that's really beautiful, the art of interviewing where it's like, you don't really need to know everything. You just need to know the right questions and be able to connect with people. Yeah, it's kind of humbling to be in front of a world renowned athlete and say, you know what, I don't quite get that. Can you explain that to me? And you'll find if you if you go in not pretending like you know everything, people are really eager to share this game with you and to, to share what what they can teach you. Um, and sometimes have you ever seen those interviews with football players where somebody asks them about a coverage and they are more than happy to break it down. It's like, why did you cut this way instead of this way? What were you noticing on the field? They might give you a five minute answer just because they study this stuff so much. They're the experts and it's fun to share that knowledge. But overall, like, what is it like to get to interview some of these top NBA players and, you know, even get to build relationships with them? Yeah, Mahi, you know, what's interesting is one of my favorite things to ask these players is nothing related to basketball. It's what Netflix show are you watching right now? Or, you know, hey, how are your kids? It was just Halloween. What did you guys dress up for? I think when you treat them as people and don't put them on that, oh my gosh, you're Steph Curry, you're on a pedestal. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I was fangirling over Steph every time I had to talk to him. You just have to relate on that people level. But I do understand that one day I'll get to tell my kids that I worked with some of the greatest players to ever play this game. And it's hard to recognize it in the moment. Like Steph will be due to make history this season. He's very likely going to pass Ray Allen for the all time, most three pointers made in NBA history. And I don't know if, I think it might take me, I don't know, five years to look back on that and be like, wow. Or my first season covering the team, they won a championship. Yeah. And just now I'm able to reflect on that and how special that was. Whereas when I was inside the whirlwind, I was just trying to get by day by day, you know? Yeah. But like when you first started interviewing, I mean, like, did you ever get that sort of like feeling like, oh my gosh, like I'm interviewing these big people? Um, yes, to be honest. And, and a little, I try not to. Um, my first day of practice covering the Warriors, I was working myself up to, to introduce myself to Steph. And he's a hard person to have a one-on-one -on -one moment with. And the way it works for, for reporters at practice is like the player will sit at a table or a podium, we all gather around. So it's, we call that a scrum. There's maybe 20 people standing around the one player. And then after that player leaves the table, you kind of run over to sort of get a moment with him. But Steph came up to me and I was shocked, actually. He's like, congratulations. I heard you got this job. Your name is Kareth, right? And I was like, y -y -y yes. <laughs> so I had built myself up to try to make that introduction and he short-circuited it. He, he got me. And that felt really special that Steph Curry even knew my name. And that's kind of who, who he is, actually. If you just talk to these guys like people, Kevin Durant is like that. Steve Kerr is like that. Draymond Green is like that. Clay is definitely like that. He just wants to be a regular guy who happens to play NBA basketball. Um, that, those are the most special moments to me. Yeah, and kind of building on my next question, like, have you had like a favorite interview moment? Oh, anytime I interview Clay, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, but also Andre Iguodala is really sharp and he's really funny and he kind of he'll mess with people a little bit beforehand um in some of our post-game interviews I remember he's like no no I don't want to do it no you don't need to talk to me no nope. he's resisting but it's like fake resistance and then as soon as the camera's on perfect gentleman so I don't know the guys like to tease and if you can tease back it's actually kind of endearing <laughs> And like, I know that you did reporting for like Rio 2016 Olympic Games, and then like you worked with UConn, both men and the women's basketball team. Like, did you always like, like to report basketball specifically? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I did. But you know what? My favorite sports before I started on a basketball course were football 
and hockey. I thought hockey might actually be my direction. Um, but then my boss at a place called SNY said, we have this new UConn deal. We are going to show our, our coverage reach will show UConn women's basketball in four states. It's kind of a big deal. Would you like to be the sideline reporter? And I had never done sideline reporting before, but I said, yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I want to do that. And then I figured it out on the job. And then that experience covering four consecutive national championships with the Yukon women um, helped me get that Olympics job covering women's basketball at the Rio games. Gino Oriema was the head coach that year. Don Staley was one of the coaches. Now look at her, she's amazing. Um, and then that experience covering the Olympics helped me get this Warriors job. So everything is sort of built on itself and it all had to do with my boss saying, hey, you wanna do this? And me having a moment in my heart where I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if I can, I'm a little scared, but blurting out, yes. Yeah, no, I think it's really cool to see people's stories because I think it's really about taking that first step and it's about saying, I'm gonna go do something that ends up kind of building into something a lot bigger than what they could have ever imagined. Yeah, I, I, I come, how do I say this? I often throw up hurdles in my own way and I'm really trying to knock that down. Why do I feel this hesitation? Why do I feel like I can't do something? Can't is such a stupid word. Of course I could do this. Um, so why do, I, why do I have that inside myself? And I'm, I'm still working on that in my career, but I, I wanna make sure that I say yes to new experiences. Yes, yes, yes. And see where that takes me. But how do you, like what advice do you have for people who are just taking that first step and kind of going for it? Advice would be relationships are very important. Um, be a humble person. Don't pretend like you know everything. Um, and just, it's just talk. It's, it's, no, it's not just talking to the players, it's talking to the people around them. Who is the support staff? Who can kind of give you some insights? Um, who's the person you know, doing security in the garage? Because that person is important too. Nobody is too small. Um, everybody has a story. Um, and sort of be an inquisitive person, be curious, talk to them, and always be prepared. Um, that's the minimum that you can do before you talk to somebody. If you do have a player or coach interview, know what they're all about, know what they're going through, know what the moment in time is for the team. Maybe have a few statistics to help you out, but never I'm trying to say that there, there are not stupid questions, but there can be questions that are much more informed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But how, how can you differentiate? Like, how do you make sure your questions are like good? Because it can definitely be hard. And sometimes you have questions they don't always hit with people or players might get upset and stuff. Yeah, I will always give people the benefit of the doubt. Maybe if it's the worst, worst loss of all time, they lost by 50. Your question isn't, wow, what went wrong? It's sort of like, hey, the turnovers looked a little tough tonight. Why do you think those happened? So you don't slam somebody for a mistake. You come from a place of understanding, understanding they didn't want to play that poorly. So what happened? What, you know, what, what was the issue there? So there's a delicacy to some of these questions. And I think when you come from a place of, of kindness, because you know, Mahi, criticism is fair and not every topic for a team is going to be a positive one, but you can figure out how to ask those tough questions in a way where everybody feels respected. Yeah. No, it's crazy because I feel like you just, you know, a lot of these nuances about interviewing and stuff. Like, did you just learn this, like, like on the job, like on the flyer? Did someone like teach this to you before you even went in? It's both. It's, it's on the job learning. And I think I have a great experience, had a great experience coming up where I got to hear the questions of other reporters and how well they ask things or when they didn't. You can kind of sense when people bristle when a question just lands all wrong. And by listening, you know, when I was younger, I would know, okay, I've, I've got to ask about this topic and this topic, but they're tough. So I don't know how. And I would listen to how other reporters said it and sort of glean from that, wow, that was good, or mm, that's not the way that I would have done it in hindsight. And you know, I've, even now, sometimes I have questions in my head that I think sound one way. And then when I speak them, they don't sound the way I intended. Um, and that's just, a, that's a part of it. You know, it happens and trial and error. Yeah, it's a lot of repetition, just going out there, putting yourself out there, doing it. 
Yeah. And anyway, it's hard to do that. Cause I think like most people, you know, you just go out and you try and like you fail and it's whatever, but like, I think when you're being highlighted, when you're on the camera, when you fail, it's a bigger deal. So everybody sees that failure and there's your face right there. <laughs> the face of failure. <laughs> So like, was that hard or like, you know, just trying to like learn things throughout the job, but it's also like, you're also being on the spotlight while you're trying to learn and like make the mistakes and grow from them. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, sometimes I still blank. Sometimes I need a cheat sheet just to get myself back in the moment, even if it's a split second that I have to look down and you know, nobody is perfect. I still make mistakes. I will always make mistakes. So I learned how to make the mistakes. I don't make them worse. Usually I smile real quick just to let people know, uh, yep, I, I heard what you heard, yep, but I'm in on the joke, I smile, and then you just move on. You, you don't really bring any more attention to it, because when I don't take a smile, the mistakes will start to snowball. I'll feel it. I get nervous. I get a little choked up, and I can't spit the words out, and that just feels worse and worse, so I try to smile, take a quick breath, and then move on to my next point, and then it's gone. Yeah. No, it sounds so familiar to basketball, you know, as an athlete, I bet you can relate. And then watching other people play, I mean, you can't live in that mistake. You got to move straight forward. Exactly. It moves very quickly. Yeah. No, especially when you're like doing an interview and you're trying to talk and you're trying to get things through and then things aren't working. No. It can be rough. Nope. Next play, right? Next play. Next play. Next play mentality. I mean, you talked about this, like reporting for the championships. I mean, like, what is that like? Like, getting to interview someone right after they just like won a national championship? It is tremendous because being a reporter means you get to see behind the scenes things. So the Warriors won their last championship in Cleveland. Nobody wants to celebrate on a hostile team's floor. So they all came into the tunnel and I got to see that and their families are there and people are crying and hugging. And I interviewed Bob Myers as he came off the court and I was trying to ask him those emotional questions. And he said, the thing he's going to remember about this championship is that his family could not be there. His wife was just about to have a baby or she had the baby. So he felt alone in that moment, which I thought was something, you know, really powerful for him to share. He's like, I want my wife and kids here. Um, so it's seeing those behind the scenes things that I think I'll remember the most, um, how much work it was, how many people from my network were there. Like really, you only see the people on TV, but imagine 20 people behind the scenes doing very important things to get what you see on TV out there. So it was the Warriors team, it was our team, and it was really long nights, but sort of bonding over that experience. Um, to cover a championship is something some reporters never get in their career. It's really hard to win a championship. And I feel so charmed in my career that I've gotten to cover cover a collection of them, plus some gold medals. It's I feel lucky every day. And more than that, I mean, you kind of, you've been with the Warriors since 2017. You kind of gotten to go to the championships to, you know, winning 15 games in the season. Like, what has it kind of been like just that whole journey of like going through that? Yeah, and thank you. You're well researched. You're prepared. Um, <laughs> my first season on the job with the Warriors was a championship season. And then after that was the season they went to the finals against the Raptors. That was the year Clay got hurt. That was the year Kevin Durant got hurt. Um, and then at the beginning of the next season, that's when Steph Curry broke his hand. Um, that was the 15 win season for the Warriors. So we're talking championship finals, 15 wins, worst record in the league. And then now things are starting to come back. There was last season where the Warriors were the play-in team um, and this season to be determined. So we've just described something that's definitely felt like this. And through it all, one of the biggest learning experiences was their worst season, actually, when they only won 15 games. Because, you know, you learn win or lose. You have an obligation to these players and to fans to cover the team the exact same way. Just because they're playing poorly doesn't mean, or, or that they're not the same, you know, that the roster talent just wasn't the same. You still have an obligation to have the same high quality reporting no matter what's going on. And players do notice who's there when things are going bad. And that's actually a great occasion to make relationships. Like I'm gonna stick with you through thick and thin. I don't care about wins or losses. I care about you. I wanna know what's going on in your life. I wanna tell your story. Do you trust me to do it? So those are the moments where you can really bond with players. 
I've actually found like there's a there's a really good reporter named Marcus Thompson who has covered Steph Curry since he first got to back in the day to Oakland. And they have a really good bond now because they came up together through those, you know, those tough years, the lean years. Um, and Steph knows that Marcus is always going to treat him the same. Yeah. No, and I think it's also like cool when you see players and like just the interviewers and that sort of that dynamic, because I think it's important that you as an interviewer have a good relationship with the interviewee, because that's when you really get those good questions. And more than that, they feel comfortable. And I think that can definitely be hard, even on the podcast where you're trying to just make someone open up about something and they might not always want to do that. And you, you don't want to push, but like you also, you want them to talk about something that's really cool. Yeah, you can push a little bit, but you definitely need to look at their their cues. If you can, if you if you were to ask me a question that makes me sit back like this, <laughs> go like this, <laughs> I think you can tell like mm, maybe don't needle on that one. Um, I've noticed, and I feel really happy and proud of this, but the players know what I'm about now. They know the types of questions that I'm going to ask them. They know I'm not gonna surprise them with anything out of left field during a live interview. We might talk about zany stuff off the court. For example, a fan asked me to ask Steph Curry, what is his favorite dinosaur? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I will do that, but I have to I have to wait for the right moment. You know, it's not appropriate sometimes. Um, but if I can ever catch Steph in the hallway and be like, hey man, what's your favorite dinosaur? <laughs> I bet he would have one and I bet he would get a kick out of that question. And like being like a woman in this industry, I mean, like I think it's amazing for young girls like me, even whether you're interested in media or not, to be watching the NBA game and get to see like a female out there just like on the court talking to players. I mean, how did that feel to kind of just be trailblazing a path for the next generation of girls in media? That's a compliment I don't even know how to handle. And I feel so flattered because I do have people say, how do I do what you do? What kind of path did you take? Um, I went to college for this stuff. I've known since fourth grade, I've wanted to be a reporter. Not everybody knows their destiny in fourth grade and that's okay. You can kind of figure out what you wanna do. I want to help everybody who comes to me as best as I can. And I wanna say, yes to things, especially when somebody puts themselves out there like you did and like took a chance and asked, asked me if I could do this. I was like, sure, sure. Why not? I want to help you. Sure. So it's just saying yes to things and sort of being aware that I'm somebody that they see. And I hope I can be a good role model. I hope I can do this job to the best of my ability every day. So people feel proud of me and I feel proud of myself. No, and I think you totally are, you know, and I reached out to you and you're just, just so nice and so humble and you wouldn't even know I'm talking to somebody like this, you know, just, you treated me like I was, I was like high up, you know, and it was, it was just really kind of you. I really appreciate you coming on. You're welcome. I think it's ambitious that you have a podcast. I, how long have you been doing this? So I started this last June um, during COVID and like, I've just really been interested in like listening to people's stories and learning from them because I think a lot of people go through the same things that you go through and you don't even realize that and so for me that was Steph Curry and so I was like in third fourth grade playing basketball and I listened to his story about like not being highly recruited in college and I was like wait no way like he was bad at some point because you see him he's like shooting all these threes and stuff and so that inspired me. And I think like listening to people's stories is just so inspirational and you, you can get through things just by listening that other people have gotten through them because you're like, wait, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your questions have been good. I appreciate it. And you know, I've been thinking about starting a podcast and I just haven't done it. And that's sort of a criticism that I have of myself. Like ideas just stay locked in my head and I don't execute on them, but you did, you did it. That's really cool. Oh my gosh. No, if you had a podcast, Gareth, I would be so listening to that, please. All right. I'll try. New Year goals. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So last question for you, like what advice do you have for young girls looking to pursue journalism? Oh man. Um, be prepared. Know that you belong. You belong here. Any single person can understand sports, play sports and love the game. You belong. And I think, unfortunately, because there aren't as many women in sports, which is getting better, by the way. I'm not the only woman in that locker room. I look around and it just feels normal. There are very few days where I feel aware of my gender and work. But when I was coming up, it wasn't, it wasn't as good. And there were times early on in my career where I looked at other women with jealousy. Why do you have this job? I know I could do that. Why, do you, why are you there? And that's toxic. It, it's... I knew I was ambitious, 
but I didn't have a great place to put it that didn't kind of have jealousy of other people. And I really had to, to scold myself for that. That's not a good way to go through things. If you look at other women as comrades, not the competition, you'll find that having female friends in the industry is the only way you'll survive because they also know exactly what you're going through. So it makes me feel a lot happier to see women as friends on the job. And anytime I see somebody new in the room where we're doing the interviews, I wanna make sure I go up and introduce myself just so they know it's a friendly environment and we can do this together. No, I love that. Look at it as a possibility instead of a competition, because I think that definitely can happen in so many different aspects where you look at someone who's doing something better than you and you're like, oh my gosh, like, why are they doing that? But then it's also like, wait, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. There is room for everybody and sports are competitive and reporting is competitive. If you want to move up, you know, there aren't too many jobs, but it feels much better to go into work every day when you're not trying to step on other people. So well said. Well, thank you so much. This was so embarrassing. This was embarrassing. This was so entertaining. I loved it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Mahi. <laughs>